Welcome to Global Take, presented by School Rubric, a show about the international teaching experience. Teaching internationally is one of the best decisions you can make as an educator. In this show, we will meet teachers and administrators from around the globe, living and working internationally. Our hope is that their stories and experiences will inspire you to explore the world of education. We will learn about all aspects of international teaching, from becoming an international teacher, to what countries are the best fit for you, to the challenges of being away from your home country. Come take this unforgettable journey to the world of international schools with Global Take, presented by School Rubric. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Global Take here on School Rubric. My name is Nick DeForest, and I'm back again with another special episode here. Um, I've written a book. It's called A Global Playbook, and this is episode three uh, of us talking about each chapter with a different um, contributor to the book. Um, there's six chapters, core, commitment, care, culture, competition, and communication. We're on number three. We're on care today. Uh, just a bit of a, a deep dive into the things. But of course, this can be a standalone episode where you can get some uh, great info um, for, for ADs, for coaches, for principals, for directors. The book is for anybody in international education or wanting to get into it. And I have um, the, the person who submitted to the introduction. Um, here she is right here. Hi, Kat. Welcome. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, Nick. You're welcome. A beautiful background, much better than mine. Um, Kat submitted the <laughs> uh, submission for the introduction, a really great long one. Um, she is in the Philippines. Um, and yeah, so we're going to chat about her section. I have some questions lined up for her about that and also some of the other subsections of the book from some of the other people. Um, yeah, so Kat, let's just get right underway. Um, your submission right off the top, uh, you said, believe, you believe that is the job of school leaders to find and distribute opportunities that draw out and encourage increased engagement by students and let them know that we care perfect for the section on care. Um, and I know you do that with your students. You, you uh, look for ways to, to use their voice. And I wonder to start if you could just share a memorable experience um, that will stand out to you, something from one of your students. Well, thanks, Nick, for asking and congratulations on this wonderful book that, that you know, is here to help students and to help all the athletic activities directors around the world. So, so fantastic for giving everybody this opportunity. Um, so, so yes, yeah, student voices was, was the part that I wrote. And, um, and, and it's true. I think that the, the leaders of the school should promote this. Um, and one experience that came out of actually COVID times, I mean, unfortunately, but it did come out of COVID yeah. times. So it was a good thing was that our, our high school principal, we call her upper school principal, um, she actually encouraged me to encourage our executive council, which is for, of all the student councils, we have the freshman council all the way up to senior, our executive are the top council members. Um, she encouraged me to encourage them to get more involved. And mind you, this goes back to the Philippines, who I wanna say was the school, was a country that was online for over two years. I think we may be one of only two in the whole world that were online during COVID for only two years. We just got back of, of this year. So it was it was pretty bad is the word I'm gonna use. Um, but this was an opportunity that was born from the idea of my upper school principal to give students a voice. And she encouraged it through the executive council. And what she, recommended was to have the executive council run 
our chapel assemblies. We have a chapel assemblies once a week. And the, the theme for them was to encourage student wellness, which obviously was an important theme at that time, still is, but more so at that time when we were online. And so this was a, a way to promote peer-to-peer -peer student wellness for the whole high school, whole upper school. And it was from your fellow student, the executive council. And so it, it encouraged engagement and it showed that we cared two things that we wanted as an outcome. And the executive council was in charge of planning, promoting, communicating and executing including intro, um, the, the briefing, question and answer at the end. Um, and so it was a way for, for us as student leaders, uh, you know, part of the admin to show that we cared, wanted student engagement. And it did result in a lot of our upper school students to get involved and to voice out their concerns and, and how they felt. And so that's a memorable experience that happened during COVID, which was, you know, a year ago. Yeah, that's great. I mean, the kids are there, right? And sometimes they just need that push uh, or encouragement to to stay and use their voice, right? Great. Right, great. right, yeah. Great. Well, um, this chapter, chapter three, has a lot of subsections and a lot of people that uh, contributed. It's one of the biggest ones. Uh, and one of them is from John Powell. Um, and he talked to, and, and said, um, Anything to show appreciation and come together is important, right? And caring about your coaching staff. Um, and he said, you know, maybe your school can help support it financially, maybe not, but he urged people to get creative and to do things with their coaches to show that you care. So I do a little bit, um, big coaching staff. We don't do anything um, all together too much. We do a season by season. But I wonder if you have anything or have done anything creative with your coaches. So we we are a school that does not pay our coaches. It's part of our ethos that, you know, it's a way to to create a passion, um, you know, without the monetary benefits of, of it. And and it's interesting because even without our paying, I get some fantastic coaches, dedicated, passionate, you know, just, just very involved coaches. And, but I feel like the onus is on me because we don't pay. It's a little bit more pressure. How yeah. can I give back either professional development or just their wellness? And I mean, aside from the normal treating them out after every season, having a, having an end of the, end of the year party for them, food and drinks and, and all of that and, and showing appreciation verbally. Um, I think what's important also is the physical element of their well-being. And so I try to encourage activities, sports mainly, such as we have volleyball on Mondays for staff and faculty. We've got Tuesdays and Thursdays basketball. We've got Tuesday flag frisbee. And this is all for faculty and staff. We have Thursday floor hockey so so just the physical side because i think wellness you know a lot of it is physical wellness um, i think physical wellness leads to mental wellness and so i am all out effort that if if some of our faculty and staff coaches want to start up an activity i will support it a hundred percent and so that's my way of promoting their wellness um, i also believe that the divide between faculty and staff, I don't like to see that divide. And so I think that as a community for all of us to be together um, is important. So I'd like to open it. I'd like to open it up to both faculty and staff and admin. And, and we do, we get a lot of involvement. So yeah, yeah that's my that's, way that's of great. yeah helping. That's great. And as you were telling that, I, I, I didn't know obviously the answer or that you didn't pay and that's when you really need to be creative. And um, I was just thinking as you're talking about their wellness, of course, that's um, fantastic, but it brings that uh, group together, as you said at the end, right? That it's it brings everyone together and um, kind of a level playing field then, you know, the faculty and yeah, that's great. That's great. Yeah, it's fun. It's a lot of fun. No matter what sport it is, it's just fun to, to get together and play. 
Cool. All right. Well, I mentioned a lot of the uh, uh, contributors to this section, and I have a short video uh, from one of them, good friend of mine, Molly. Um, so, Kat, we get a little bit of a break here as we listen to Molly talk about her section. Hi, I'm Molly Burwagger, and I am here on the campus of the American International School in beautiful Vienna. And I'm here to talk about the section that I wrote under care in Nick's book. And I wrote this section after presenting at Nick's first virtual conference. And I presented on how learning sport teachers need to connect with coaches in order to share strengths and challenges for our student athletes. I think it's very important to connect both of these worlds so students are supported both in the classroom and also outside of the classroom. We need to make sure that they're receiving their accommodations um, on the field as well as in the classroom. So I think it's very important to connect those worlds and that is why I wrote a section in CARE. Thank you very much. All right, all right, thanks Molly. Um, yeah, something I think is, is very unique to school sports is we have this link to students, resource teachers, and accommodations, as Molly said. Um, and it's right there for us, um, but sometimes not as easy as it seems to get that information and disseminate it to coaches um, to help the kids. So uh, Kat, I just wonder what it's like at your school. Do you have a link to the resource teachers and counselors where you are? You know, we don't have a specific link that links the coaches to the learning support teachers. Um, and, and it sounds like a fantastic idea. And so I'm going to look into that. Um, we do have good support, though, from our counselors and our student services teachers. Mm -hmm. And they contact me if there's if they see anything that needs, you know, needs needs help. Um, our clinic as well. Um, mm -hmm. They're always helpful in sending information, um, you know, about different learning support that coaches can can give. And so I do appreciate that, but I like your idea of having a single link as a resource because I think that would be so much better. I mean, data privacy and stuff like that, I'd have to take that in, into consideration like we all do, but that sounds like a great idea. Right now it's ad hoc um, and, and there is that support to the coaches when it comes to how to help them communicate better with specific students. Um, but yeah, I do like your idea. I'm going to look into that. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, yeah Thanks, Molly. <laughs> exactly. Right? That was her her idea, and, and that just came because of of um, you know me having some issues and challenges with some students, and uh, we coached together. And I said, "Hey, man, what's?" And she explained that that this is this students, uh, you know, what they need a little bit extra, and uh, you know, kind of light bulb went off. So, yeah, that's a, a great tip I think from the book that aren't uh, isn't happening in too many places. So, see, yeah. that's why read your book. Yeah, that's the kind of yeah, stuff exactly. you're going to get. It was, you know, a bit uh, of, for me, the writing of the book, you know, and getting submissions from people. I learned so much from different submissions from people like yours, um, which was part of why I wanted to do it in the first place. So it's great. Great. Well, we have one more question um, for you. One more subsection um, that I think like we had to talk about in this section, uh, in this episode as being a, a female AD. Um, there was one section on uh, gender equality, uh, and Turner um, talked about Title IX. Title IX in the U.S. Um, was an equal rights um, bill, and it's 50 years old. Right. So, you know, he talked about it. We don't have to, in international schools, we don't have to follow U.S. rules, but we often look to them as best practices. So um, he wrote about Title IX. Um, that's important to remember that it isn't just a law in the U.S., um, it is instead of a framework that can be universally applied to ensure that we are objectively offering uh, equality in our programs to students. Um, and I don't know if that's a huge issue in international schools around the world like it was then and still is now in the U.S. Um, I tend to favor female teams. Um, I'm a female coach right now. But as a female AD, uh, I just wonder... You know, is this something that you think about on a daily, weekly basis, um, this question of equality? Uh, and if so, do you have any tips for other ADs that, that really just want to do the right thing for all of their students? You know, it's surprising, but I get asked this question a lot. And, and I really don't feel 
of course, international school is different from, from in the US, as, as you know, of course. I don't actually feel that there is inequality in my school anyway. Um, but having said that, obviously, your book and, and all of the professional development that I've taken and IAAA uh, Title IX courses and, mm -hmm. and the legal courses has made me think about these things and therefore I'm more conscious of them vis-a-vis um, -vis when I first started out as an athletic director at Brent. So, so it, I don't feel there's inequality in my school, but I am hyper aware that there should not be. Um, I don't believe I favor one gender over another. I coach both female and male um, mm -hmm. teams. And so I, I, I coach them the same. And I think our whole community does not favor. I don't feel any bias from our admin or from our faculty or from our coaches or, or from the community even um, towards male or, or female. I mean, that can go both ways, right? But I do believe that as a tip, um, to be educated like, like I was, because I was uneducated before I learned uh, from the NIAAA about Title IX, um, and I think being proactive to to just keeping tabs to make sure that there is that equity, um, no matter the gender, and to give opportunities for all, whether it's sports, visual performing arts, um, ASAs, after school activities, or student yeah. leadership. Um, I, I, I do believe that that would be a tip to just be conscious, just be aware, and just be vigilant that that never slacks. Yeah. That would be my tip yeah that's great and it's small things right that that's you know to kids or, or maybe to their parents may seem like a big a big thing and the one thing that i was doing all the time is when we had exchanges or um the, the crosstown rival would come in and would play you know varsity soccer against us i would always schedule the guys game last um mm. and i didn't do that because i felt like they were better um, in my mind, I knew the girls would stick around and watch the guys, but I wasn't confident the guys would stick around and watch the girls. Uh -huh. um, and so I did it out of that reason, but I had had some people come up to me and say, hey, you know, we never get the premium time slot. You know, we never get that last time slot. And, you know, they were looking at it from a different lens. And I thought, yeah, you know, that's right. So now I, we switch it up. Uh, you know, I, you having mentioned that, it it triggers a memory that, our Asia Pacific Activities Conference, APAC, that's our major tournament, culminating tournament. Um, mm -hmm. When I came in, this wasn't any of my doing, but when I came into the league, it was already um, per year, we would have a, a female year and a male year, which meant exactly what you said, that the premier mm -hmm. slots one year would go to the females yeah. and then the following year would go to the males. So that was already you know, in effect yeah. by the time I got there. So yeah, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Some people took, some people before you also um, read about Title IX maybe, or or just knew that that was the right thing to do. <laughs> For sure. Yeah, great. For sure, well, yeah. Um, Kat, thanks so much uh, for this short, but but really nice conversation. Um, this morning for me, uh, part of your holiday as we see the palm trees uh, behind you. Um, yeah, it was really good, really good. <laughs> Get a different perspective on some of the sections um short as it is and yeah the other the other contributors there were a lot um here's my my graphic thank you to all the other people that contributed to chapter three um there's some great things in there it's a long section um care is is really a no-brainer uh, i think i wrote that in the book and it is obviously we have to care but there's different levels of how we can um, care for all the different groups and and people in our communities so um, thanks to everyone there um, for being a part of this important chapter. Um, and thank you, Kat, for being here this morning. Um, this is number three. There's three more coming. Um, and I hope anyone out there who hasn't picked up the book or looked into it uh, will do so. Uh, a global playbook. And you can check it out on Globetrot and ADs on my website there slash book. And School Rubric, the publisher and the host of this global take today. So. Kat, thanks again. Um, appreciate your time. Well, thanks so much, Nick. It is an honor to be a part of your book and to be a part of you helping everybody else. So I'm truly honored to be here. Thank you so much. Great.
You're very welcome. And we'll look forward to other ways we can collaborate. Um, and we'll see each other soon in person. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Nick. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thanks for watching and learning with us at School Rubric with educators from around the globe. For more access to articles, magazines, podcasts, live episodes, our international school directory, courses, and more, visit us at schoolrubric.org. Thank you.